Hi, everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute. Hi, for those of us who are joining now, we're going to get started in just a minute. All right, welcome everyone to the 2023 PI Conference. My name is Megan Messick and I will be your host for this afternoon's session. Today we will learn about the power of plasma. We'll hear about plasma production for medical treatments, from donation to product, and additionally learn about the history of convalescent plasma. There will be time for questions at the end of the presentation, so be sure to submit any that you have for our speakers using the Q&A section of our platform. But without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce our two presenters today, the first being Julie Burkoffer. Julie has 30 years of government relations and policy experience, primarily focusing on the healthcare industry. Her areas of expertise include coalition building, strategic planning, Medicare reimbursement, public affairs, issue analysis, and grassroots networking. Ms. Burkoffer assumed the leadership role as the head of the North American Division in October 2004. The North America Division is responsible for federal and state affairs, stakeholder relationships, as well as communication within the United States. Among her accomplishments, Ms. Burkoffer was awarded the Unsung Hero Award from the Hemophilia Association of New Jersey. Ms. Burkoffer also received an advocacy award from the Alpha One Foundation. Ms. Burkoffer has been promoted several times during her tenure at PPTA and currently holds the position of Senior Vice President, Head of North America. In this role, she is the liaison to the North America Board of Directors, coordinates the federal and state health policy activities of the association, administers the North America programs, notably the patient notification system, and has the distinct pleasure of coordinating outreach to patient organizations. Prior to joining PPTA in 2001 as the Director of Health Policy, she served in the office of former Pennsylvania Governor Tom Ridge as the Associate Director of Domestic and Health Policy. Ms. Burkoffer also served as a sworn member of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Advisory Committee on Blood Safety and Availability. Ms. Burkoffer was Senior Government Affairs Representative at Highmark, Inc. and focused on major health insurance issues such as the Patients' Bill of Rights, and Medicare prescription drug coverage. In addition, she served as a vice president at R. Duffy Wall and Associates, Inc., a government relations consulting firm. She also served the senior congressional representative for the 20,000 member American Chiropractic Association. Early in her career, Ms. Burkhofer was a policy analyst at the American Medical Peer Review Association, where she developed her Medicare policy skills. Julie, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm also excited to welcome our second speaker today, Arturo Casa Duval. He is a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor and Alfred and Jill Summer Chair of the Molecular Microbiology and Immunology at John Hopkins School of Public Health. He received his MD and PhD degrees from New York University and completed his internship residency in internal medicine at Bellevue Hospital and specialized in infectious diseases at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. The author of over 900 papers, books, and chapters, his major research interests are in fungal pathogenesis and the mechanisms of antibody action. 
He is editor-in-chief of MBIO, was deputy editor of the Journal of Clinical Investigation, and serves on several editorial boards. He has served on the National Science Board for Biosecurity and the National Commission on Forensic Science. He is currently chair of the Board of Governors of the American Academy of Microbiology, the honorific arm of the American Society for Microbiology, and has received numerous honors, including election to the American Society for Clinical Investigation, American Academy of Physicians, American Academy of Microbiology, Fellow of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of Medicine. I don't think between the both of you, we could have any more expertise than we have. This is incredible. And uh, I know our audience is gonna be very excited to hear from you both today um, regarding plasma. So to kick us off, I'm gonna go ahead, Julie, if you're ready and share your portion of our slide deck. Sure, thank you, Megan. And uh, greetings to everyone joining this session. I hope you'll find it interesting. Uh, congratulations to the IDF on your annual national conference, wishing you much success. Um, if you listen to my introduction, my bio, I too was shocked that I've been in this sector. I've been working at PPTA since 2001, and I've enjoyed my career and the contributions that we've all made together, the industry, uh, the patients, all of us working together uh, on behalf of access and um, healthy plasma donation. I'm very passionate about plasma. I really love what I do. And the best part of it is working with the patient organizations, uh, especially the Immune Deficiency Foundation. So today um, we're going to talk about a little overview of uh, the plasma protein therapeutics Association, we can look at the next slide, um, talk a little bit about plasma donation, <clears throat> and then um, the importance of awareness. Um, each of you on this call are definitely aware, I would hope, of how your therapy that you use, um, you, some of you may use immune globulin, uh, that it comes from people, plasma donors. And some of you may not fully understand what plasma donation is, and that's what we're gonna talk about uh, today. Um, first, let me tell you a little bit uh, about the mission of the Plasma Protein Therapeutics Association. We strive to be a trusted partner to health systems and drive broad and reliable access to high quality plasma protein therapies. Um, again, that would be immune globulin, the intravenous immune globulin, IVIG, or the subcutaneous uh, SCIG. Our focus is on the well being of patients and donors. There's a real relationship there. It's a person to person relationship. The donor is donating the much needed plasma, and the patient is the recipient of safe and effective immune globulin therapy. Take a look at the next slide and you'll get a glimpse of our member companies uh, in North America. You may be familiar um, with Griffles, Cicada, Kedrion, and Adma. Um, they all have immune globulin therapies in the U.S. market. Um, they all participate in our patient notification system that we'll talk about in the end. Some of you may already be registered. Um, <clears throat> Our next slide, we'll talk a little about plasma donation. Plasma donation is something that people, for various reasons that are committed to helping others, you can donate plasma up to twice a week in the US. Donors must be healthy. They are compensated <clears throat> for their donation. And it's a machine um, and a process called plasmapheresis, where the donor's plasma is collected and the remaining blood components, the white cells, the red cells, the platelets, is all returned back to the donor. And that's what makes this process of plasmapheresis 
different than a whole blood donation. Um, again, plasma donors can donate up to twice a week. Um, that's a little unusual. Uh, most people can't get to a plasma donation center in the midst of their day-to-day -day lives, but we do rely on healthy repeat donors. And there are over 1,100 plasma donation centers across the United States. If you're very interested in learning more, we have a special website dedicated to where are plasma donation centers. It's a very simple web address, www.donatingplasma.org. Once the donor donates their plasma, it's frozen and then shipped to state-of-the-art manufacturing facilities across the world. And if we look at the next slide, you'll get a sense and a feel of the global journey of plasma. Again, when the plasma is collected from healthy, committed donors, it, it's such a gift of life. Plasma contains proteins as well as antibodies that can really make a tremendous difference in life-saving and life-sustaining for people, um, individuals such as maybe some of you on the call yourselves or family members that have immune deficiency disorders. And we'll see in a little bit the other therapies that come from plasma that help save and improve patients' lives. But this truly is a global journey uh, and it can be a time-consuming process. It takes seven to 12 months from donation from a healthy donor through the manufacturing process to make the finished product that is then distributed uh, to the healthcare provider, um, whether it be a physician office, <clears throat> an infusion suite, a home healthcare agency, a specialty pharmacy. Um, the most important thing is that patients have access to the therapy prescribed by their doctor that um, addresses your primary immune deficiency disorder. But it is a journey. Take a look at the next slide. This is, this is just to give you a sense of who, who are plasma donors. Plasma donors are as diverse as the folks on this call. Men, women, um, 18 to 65 years old, uh, all of our plasma is protein rich and every donor should be celebrated. On the next slide, we're gonna talk for a minute about the donation process. Um, you know, it is arduous. It does take about an hour to an hour and a half. Each plasma donor, every time they go to donate must complete a series of health screenings designed to determine their suitability and to make sure that they are healthy and able to donate. It's also an important point here that only plasma collected in the United States is used to make finished immune globulin therapies that are used by US patients. And you can rest assured, again, that plasma donors are healthy individuals. They are repeat donors. They are committed. Many of them are aware that their donation helps to save and improve people's lives. Their vital signs are checked, their protein and hematocrit is checked, they complete an extensive health history questionnaire, and there are medical personnel on site at these donation centers across the United States um, that perform uh, health assessments. Now, you may ask yourself, and the next slide we're gonna talk about, why do donors donate? Why would a person want to do this? You know, plasmapheresis can be uncomfortable. Some people um, don't like the uh, donor history questionnaire. They don't like the personal and private questions that are asked about their diet, about their habits. Where did you get your tattoo? Where did you get your ears pierced? Is your piercing done at a licensed uh, facility. These are all questions. Everything must be validated to ensure that the donor is healthy to donate. Some people don't like a needle stick. Now, again, if you're a patient <clears throat> or a family member 
uh, working with uh, a loved one, you probably understand and have, have hopefully overcome the discomfort. But for some folks, a needle stick can really be uncomfortable. Uh, you're connected to a machine that can make people feel a little anxious. And the saline, uh, the anticoagulant that's used at the end of the plasmapheresis process, it can feel cold. Um, and that can be uncomfortable. So why do donors do it? It's really kind of altruistic. Donors are rewarded not just by compensation, but by knowing that they're doing good to help someone. And they appreciate being saluted and recognized for their contributions. Many donors that we've talked to and asked them, why do you keep coming back? Why do you donate? It really makes a difference for them to know and I know that the IDF has programs where you all will go to a donation center and visit and you'll thank the donors and you'll share with them a little bit about a primary immune deficiency disorder. And what, what difference does it make in your life once you're diagnosed to have access to your IVIG or your SCIG? It truly is life-changing and life-saving. Um, so really, IDF does a great job um, letting plasma no donors know why their donations are so important. Next, we can take a look at, well, what does a donation center look like? They're quite modern. They're quite state of the art. <clears throat> uh, we try to make them, our member companies try to make them as comfortable as possible. Um, you know, students enjoy their downtime donating. Uh, they can do some homework and some studies. Uh, moms and dads take a break <laughs> and they can enjoy, you know, reading a book. Some donation centers even have little areas uh, where they can provide some uh, daycare or child care while the uh, mom or dad is donating. So these are very uh, state of the art uh, facilities and the donors there are uh, treated with the utmost courtesy, uh, respect and, and care. We have across the United States over 1,100 donation centers and counting. Um, you know, every year companies are investing, they're going into communities, they're opening up more donation centers because plasma donations are important to meet patients' clinical need. And we'll talk about that in a second. If you take a look at the next slide, you can see some of the aspects, some of the standards that are in place that go above and beyond what is required or regulated by the United States Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. This industry is highly regulated because safety is utmost of the importance, safety of the donor, and again, the safety of the finished immune globulin product. And you can see here a whole range of voluntary industry standards called the uh, International Quality Plasma Program. The most important one I wanna to talk to you about is right in the middle there, the National Donor Deferral Registry. What that means <clears throat> is every time a person goes into a donation center, part of that intake process is scanning their fingerprint, um, matching it with their driver's license, the information on file, and if a person tests positive for an infectious disease, such as HIV, hepatitis B, or hepatitis C, they're permanently deferred. Uh, and this is very important for the uh, process and for the end product. Next slide. So let's look for a second. What is in that plasma that is donated, that straw, honey-colored, protein, and antibody-rich um, uh, gift that donors provide. There are several therapies uh, that you can um, extract or manufacture, um, kind of similar um, if you kind of imagine the dairy industry. Um, from a cow, there is, you know, milk and cream and cheese and butter and so on and so forth. I need to mention ice cream. Same thing for uh, crude oil. You know, you have your heating and your gasoline and then your different uh, grades, <clears throat> different types of fuel, etc. It's a process. And from plasma, 
you can get the um, proteins or the antibodies to make some really life-changing and life-saving uh, therapies. These are biologics. They're quite unique. They're quite different from traditional pharmaceuticals, pills, and tablets. These can't be made in a lab. These medicines, such as albumin, alpha-1, treats folks with genetic emphysema. Albumin, interestingly, in 1942, was um, uh, used on the battlefield, um, and it saved a lot of soldiers' lives uh, during World War II. It's just fascinating for you uh, history buffs. A C1 esterase inhibitor is <clears throat> for a swelling, hereditary angioedema. Blood clotting factors treat individuals with hemophilia and other bleeding disorders. And then, of course, you all know best uh, the benefit of access to the immune globulin, the antibody-based therapy that uh, is yielded from the plasma. So on our next slide, if you're wondering, well, gosh, how many donors does it take for me to get my therapy? And this is just on average. It's really for illustrative purposes. Uh, it's not peer-reviewed data. But just, you know, when you do some calculations, um, it takes more than 130 donations to treat one patient every year uh, with a primary immune deficiency uh, disorder. And um, you can see for the alpha-1 or for the individuals with bleeding disorders, hemophilia, um, it takes even more donors. So every time, every year, once a year, um, think of those 130 on average people. And, um, you know, I, I know you all are grateful and I know the IDF is supportive, but plasma donors do play a vital role in making the um, immune globulin therapies available. And we are grateful to them. And again, IDF has acknowledged that. And it's a really great program you all do. <clears throat> we work with many patient groups uh, around uh, the United States uh, and around the world. And you can see right there in the center, the Immune Deficiency Foundation. Um, there's no better voice to talk about the importance of access and why you know diagnosis is important and treatment is important. There's no better voice than your voice, the patient's voice, the caregiver's voice, the family member's voice. And PPTA, we're so lucky to be able to work with um, patient organizations. And uh, it really, really strengthens our advocacy. Uh, finally, just in terms of awareness, um, Lots on social media. If you see our posts, please join us, be part of that conversation. Um, you can see we have a program on the next slide, How Is Your Day? <clears throat> you could look that up on Google it, How Is Your Day? You'll see images, you'll see information, more detail. You may even see some familiar faces from folks in your community that have shared their story. Get on How Is Your Day? Share your story be part of this conversation. And then finally, I'd really like to, um, on the next slide, acknowledge and thank again, IDF, can we move to the next slide? For your Plasma Hero campaign, um, you know, this is what I was referring to. You actively are out there thanking plasma donors and connecting with them. And it's critically important. And we are very, very grateful. Um, I'd also like to uh, leave you with a call to action. If you're asking, well, what can I do? What you can do is um, in, in your hometowns, uh, in your states, in your communities, at whatever level of government, you know, local level, uh, town meetings, state, national, your members of the US House of Representatives, the United States Senate, at the federal level, talk to people. Share your story, educate them, create that awareness, join IDF in their lobbying and activities uh, to help us go into states where they have outdated regulations that actually hinder companies opening donation centers. Get on social media, join our conversation, start your own conversation, tag PPTA, we'd love to be part of it. And if you have friends or family that are healthy, that are interested, visit donatingplasma.org and encourage them to donate. My final slide is just to make you aware 
of two programs. Some of you may be registered in the patient notification system. Um, if you, uh, before you infuse or inject your medicine, if you visit this website, um, you can check your lot number and see if there have been any withdrawals or recalls. We also have a web-based data program that uh, is three months uh, age data. And you can see um, how much immune globulin is distributed, distributed into the US market. Um, <clears throat> if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And again, thank you so much for having me. And I wish you all the best at your conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, we'll now pass the mic over to Dr. Casa Duvall, who will now be sharing a little bit more in the direction of convalescent plasma. Uh, so Dr. Burkhofer told you about all the things that can be derived from plasma. And what I'm gonna focus on now is a different use of plasma. That is plasma from convalescence, people who recover from a disease have antibodies on them that can be transferred to someone. And in emergencies, such as in the early days of the COVID emergency, this was uh, a life a life saving therapy, as I'm going to tell you about. But first, I'm going to tell you I'm going to take you on a ride through history, which is a a beautiful history of antibody based therapies. So first, I want to tell you that the first Nobel Prize was given for essentially transferring antibody from one individual to the other. In those days, they, didn't, they couldn't make plasma. So what they used is they used serum. Plasma and serum are different only in that the case of, of serum, you, you take the whole blood, you spin it down in a centrifuge, and then you take the material that is floating, the yellow fluid. Plasma is different. As Julie said, you basically essentially filter it. And, and take it. But the important thing you need to know is that in both of them, the active ingredient when it comes to infectious diseases is the same, and that is antibodies. So convalescent serum, parenthesis plasma, we're going to use the words interchangeably, historically serum, we, was used throughout the 20th century. It was the only effective therapy during 19, the 1918 pandemic. It was used in many ways uh, to prevent outbreaks. Here you see a, a paper from 34, 1934, in which the serum was used to prevent an outbreak of measles. And as late as the 1940s, it was used for therapy. Uh, the data from 1918 shows, this is a meta-analysis done 100, almost 100 years later, of all the trials of them showed that those who received it were less likely to die. So, however, in the mid 19th century, in the mid 20th century, antibody therapies were abandoned largely. Part of it was because antibiotics came. So you didn't need them for the treatment of bacteria. However, for viruses, we didn't really have antivirals, but there was another problem that was discovered and in, and in, the, in using plasma. And that is that in those days, they didn't know about hepatitis viruses and viruses were, were spread. And this was how uh, some of them were discovered. Now, Dr. Burkhofer told you that that is no longer a problem because in fact, the plasma today is screened and it doesn't have any of those uh, uh, infectious agents. But historically, it led to a decrease in its use in the mid 20th century until physicians and scientists sorted out how to make it safer. Now, one of the lessons that was forgotten at this time was that antibody therapies need to be given early. And that's gonna, as I tell you a little bit about what happened with COVID. And I'll read to you something from the 1930s. It is a fundamental principle of all theorem therapy uh, substitute plasma therapy, that to obtain the best results, the serum must be given early in disease. This statement holds true regardless of whether one is using antitoxic or antibacterial serum or antiviral. So what happened in 2020? Three years ago, although it happened, it feels like it was an eternity ago. 
COVID struck, there was no therapy. And the United States took a very different tack than the rest of the world. In the United States, the FDA, based on the history, decided that there was a good likelihood that this was going to work. And given that there was nothing available, set up a program by which physicians could give convalescent plasma. So the American citizens had access to plasma, and as I'm about to show you, is used increased rapidly. But by the early summer, there was a lot of criticism. How could the FDA allow this to happen without knowing whether it is safe or efficacious? The rest of the world takes a very different tack. It, most countries allow its use only in randomized controlled trials. That trial is where you separate the two groups, you give it to one and you don't give it to the other. But here is the catch. They set up the trials without knowing very much about what they were doing. Because since the only way to use it was in a trial, they basically set them up with our knowledge of the dose, window of efficacy. And these were set up in many countries, and this was gonna have a devastating effect when they came in negative. In the United States, you can see the number of cases and you can use your amount of plasma. They follow each other. The more cases there was, the more plasma was up until, until the spring of 2021. We were able to show this, the Mayo Clinic set up, the, the government gave the Mayo Clinic a contract uh, led by Michael Joyner, in which what he did was they monitor the use of convalescent plasma in the United States. And he was able in the very early months, able to be shown that it was safe. There was all these concerns about if you give antibody, you may trigger a cytokine storm, or you may cause a phenomenon known as antibody-dependent enhancement. No. In fact, plasma administration during COVID was shown to be very safe. The question was, was it working? Well, think about it. They had no control group. Everybody was being treated. However, the FDA, in collaboration with the group at Mayo, and I was involved in the studies, looked at the data and said, can we find evidence of efficacy? And the answer was yes. Looking at 35,000 patients, it was clear that those that were treated in the first day, three days of hospitalization, were less likely to die than those who were treated later, matching the warning from the 1930s. You need to treat early. But most important, there was evidence of a dose response. In other words, these units were given blindly. Doctors didn't know what they were giving. Patients didn't know what they were um, receiving because in the early days, there were no good antibody assays or neutralization assays. But by the summer of 2021, that technology was available. So now you can go and you can evaluate the units. And what it was very clear was that those that receive high tidy units, that is units with a lot of antibody, were less likely to die than those that receive uh, low antibody units. This was published in the New England Journal. And on the basis of that, the FDA issued emergency use authorization. Unfortunately, the, uh, the, the rollout of plasma was not handled well. There were errors made at the, at the presidential news conference, and it was done immediately before the Republican convention, and there were accusations that this was uh, that this was political. But as somebody who lived those days, I can tell you that that's not the case. FDA issued the the e-way when the data was available that indicating safe and effectiveness. Other studies in the United States continues to show efficacy. There, on the left, are studies for propensity control. Basically, you go into the into, into, the, into the hospital base, and you look for people who had received it versus those who didn't receive it. And again, this is a study from Sinai showing that those who are treated early were less likely to die than those who were treated later. The um, Health Corporation of America carried out a huge study involving 44,000 patients, of which about 10,000 or so had received plasma. And they showed this is real world data, machine learning, artificial intelligence analysis of the data that if you 
if you received it early, that those who received plasma were a third lot less likely to die than those that didn't. And those that treated very early in the first couple of days had a, a reduction in, in, in mortality of 47%, which is remarkable. We were able to document that the more plasma the country used, the fewer deaths. This was an epidemiologic study done by looking at the mortality per week and the plasma use per week. And from that data, we were able to calculate what would have happened had the United States not deployed convalescent plasma. We had estimated that the mortality would have been 100,000 more deaths. So the FDA is one of the heroes in this response. By moving rapidly and making plasma available, about, there are over 100,000 more Americans alive today than would have happened had the United States done what other countries did. What did the other countries did? They set up clinical trials in which he was given late in the course of hospitalization. And what you can see here is a complicated graph, but the big red cloud are the studies from other countries. They show no efficacy. Why? Because you need to treat early. At the bottom, you see green studies, including a couple that I was involved in. These were administration early in the course of disease, and in particular to our patients. And what happens there is that plasma is as expected, safe, and effective. So I want to show you the data that was that was not considered. This is data from, from the past. We're looking at, at papers from 1938, 1940s, 1913. And what you can see there is that for pneumococcus, which is a form of pneumonia, for uh, diphtheria, for meningococcal meningitis, that time is of the essence that if you want to get efficacy, you need to treat early. And he, the United, here in the United States, this was again documented. This is a study from Texas, in Houston, Texas, Methodist Hospital. And here are a complicated graph where you can see, look at the left, within three days, the curves separate. If you wait after three days, the curves are the same. And they calculated that there was a 44-hour window after admission by which you had to give the plasma if it was to work. So let's look at the most influential trial that, that essentially gave plasma, uh, had a huge impact on the use of plasma. This is the recovery trial in the United States. 50% of the patients were treated after 48 hours. I randomized, I'm sorry. That, that's not even treated. That, that means, and on the other 50% before, that means that when you randomize, that's when you order the plasma. So the plasma was used late. And in fact, 50% of the patients had their own antibody, which means that you were just giving antibody to somebody who has antibody that wouldn't be expected to work. So when this trial hit the United States, the American doctors recall and said, plasma doesn't work. And here is the, what happened in early 2021. They stop using the plasma, despite the fact that as documented by Mosafari, they were using it correctly. In other words, they were giving it on admission, they were giving it on day one or day two. But, you know, such is the hold of clinical trials in the medical mind that a lot, a, a plasma was largely abandoned. And we were able to document that there were 30 Saxon excess deaths because physicians withdrew a therapy that they were using and they didn't have anything to use. So this is an example for you where clinical research has to be very careful because there are trials that are not well designed or that, or that test a therapy in conditions when it cannot work and then conclude that it doesn't work can have a detrimental effect on care. At Hopkins, uh, we set up a clinical trial. It was led by David Sullivan and it was unequivocally established that if you treat early, that uh, antibody therapies are effective as expected. We, the, the active agent in antibodies is the same as the monoclonal antibodies, specific therapy. And this was uh, published too. So today, convalescent plasma is, it remains in the EUA. It is the only antibody therapy available in the United States. All monoclonals have been withdrawn. It remains very important for treating our immunosuppressed patients. Most of the population doesn't need it. 97% of the patients have immunity and remains useful in immunosuppressed. And my last slide is to point out 
that plasma has no profit. It is relatively cheap, $300 roughly per unit in the United States, has no patent, no pharma, it has no advocates. So it's very important that people become aware of this because uh, physicians are the major individuals uh, discussing this. It is used in major academic and medical centers, but it's used uneven. In some parts of the United States, it is not available. So if one has long COVID, smoldering COVID, the people in the audience, you need to ask your doctor about it because um, this is available today and, and remains an important therapy. There are significant physician education hurdles. The EUA will end on November 7th, 2023, because the emergency is over. But I can tell you that there are current plans for licensing. And we have finally learned how to use convalescent plasma effectively. And if we, God forbid, have to deal with another emergency, I think that this information uh, will be life-saving in the future. So with that, I will stop sharing. Thank you both for such incredible presentations. I think we could have filled another hour between the three of us if we, if we had the time for it today. But fortunately, we do have a little bit of time left to answer a couple of audience questions that have been submitted to us. Uh, and just as a reminder, uh, when it comes to our Q&A, that the information presented during the session is not medical advice, nor is it tended to be a substitute for medical advice diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with questions concerning a medical condition. So our first question that we had come in, and Julie, this came in during the your portion of the presentation, so it might have been geared towards you. CT does not have a plasma donation center. Is there a traveling plasma donation bus in the New England area? Is there criteria a company looks at in order to open a plasma donation center? Uh, this person specifically referencing uh, Farmington CT, centrally located uh, teaching hospital. Do you have any feedback for them? Sure. Um, thank you for that. Um, CT, Connecticut, uh, definitely in the New England corridor. And the good news is... Uh, um, just about two, three weeks ago, we had a very positive development in the state. A piece of legislation passed. I'm not sure if the government signed it yet, or the governor rather, um, and it opens up the state for uh, plasma donation. So um, I guess I'd say stay tuned for the good news. Uh, Lynn Albizo, um, who should be familiar, she's your uh, government relations person at IDF. Uh, <clears throat> Lynn might be able to give you a little more information, all that. But um, I think you're gonna start to see things open up in Connecticut because the regulations are antiquated and what we're trying to do is harmonize, and that's a big thing for governments to do, to harmonize the state requirements with the federal uh, laws uh, the, that are put in place by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. So I think soon you'll see some centers uh, opening. The criteria would be, you know, population. Are there enough people there uh, to sustain uh, the business of collecting plasma um, with regard to, and, and they're brick and mortar places. With regard to a mobile unit, um, no, not in the US. These are not like, uh, not nor in Europe. These aren't really like blood banks where you have the mobile buses. It's because of the time it takes to donate plasma. It can take about an hour and a half. The intake questions, the physical exam, your, again, your fingers pricked, your protein and hematocrit levels are checked. Um, you have a physical. So, you know, it's very time consuming. And then after you donate your plasma, it has to be frozen um, after it's tested and uh, unique identifiers, track and trace numbers, so the unit can be tracked throughout the process. It has to be immediately frozen. And honestly, the gift of a donation, that unit of plasma is so precious that, you know, what if a freezer's down on the mobile bus? But no, there, there are no mobile buses. And I don't believe they're uh, realistic to plan for it. But there could be good news soon in the New England corridor. Thank you so much for that perspective. We'll move on to our next question that was submitted. Uh, this one appears to be directed towards you, Dr. Casa Duvall. Given the obvious mistakes in the application of CP in trials for COVID-19, 
What changes, if any, have the FDA and researchers taken to ensure that the next time we need CP for anything, these are not repeated? Uh, we're working at designing clinical trials that can be taken off the shelf. Uh, that is, let's say we're in the midst of a bird flu outbreak. It's very scary. Bird flu is, is devastating the birds and some mammals. If that was to spill into humans, you can be sure that convalescent plasma will be rolled out again because it will be the only therapy that we have. And again, people will, some countries will demand to do only in the center of randomized controlled trials. Personally, I think based on what we know that it should be made available because we can get information from observational studies. But I think what we would like to have is, we would like to have off the shelf trials designed with the basic principles of antibody therapy, not to avoid this situation again. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. And we guys have time for one last question. Uh, and Julie, I believe this one was directed for you in our comment section. So what does the next five years look like in growing an environment and community that is actively engaged in advocating for plasma donation and access? The next five years would look like probably something that would represent what we're all thinking now. Um, more donation centers, more donors, because more patients are being diagnosed. Patients are living longer. Um, patients need access to these therapies. Um, I think the importance of better expanding the awareness and educating policymakers and payers uh, and people that are influencers about plasma and why it makes a difference in your life. Um, you know, for, for me, the next five years also could be impacted um, depending on the elections next year in the world I work in uh, with the US Congress. Um, we know some states have governors up for re-election as well. And um, the main thing that is important, I think, is that PPTA, our member companies, IDF, their great staff, and all of you on the phone, really be strong advocates. Don't be, don't ever miss an opportunity to tell your story. You never know who you'll connect with. When IDF has their advocacy days, join them on the Capitol Hill. Um, you'd be surprised how much of a difference it makes to have real people telling their real stories. Mm -hmm. So for me, the next five years is hopeful. Um, and I guess I'd love to hear from the person that asked the question, what their opinion is in the next five years. Send me an email, let me know what you think. Julie, I certainly echo your sentiment that when it comes to the next step forward in, in all of our spheres, that having community members come forward and, and be the voice of the movement, be the voice of our advocacy, our stories, that's going to be always that powerful next step we need to see change. But I want to thank both of you again for your time this afternoon. Your perspectives have been greatly appreciated by our community. And also want to remind folks that if their questions that they submitted did not get answered today, to please visit our Ask IDF resource on our website. Uh, we'd be happy to offer you support. In addition to this session being one of 39 unique learning opportunities that we're providing today and tomorrow in our 2023 PI conference, we hope that you all continue tuning in as we explore other critical topics for the PI community. And I'll additionally appoint you to one more resource in the chat section. We actually had a podcast interview with Dr. Casa Duvall that also speaks to some of the points discussed today for those who are interested in hearing a little bit more. But with that, we'll be signing off for this afternoon. And I hope each of you have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.